Madame Pogorelko. I hereby open this academic ceremony in which Vincenza Gianfredi will defend the academic thesis, an epidemiological approach to depression, social networks, psych physical activity, and diet. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Good evening, everybody. Just one second, I will share my screen. Can you see my presentation? Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. Dear Prorector, dear member of the Corona, dear colleagues, family and friends, in these 50 minutes, I would like to give you an overview of my PhD thesis entitled An Epidemiological Approach to Depression, Social Network, Physical Activity and Diet. Depression is a medical illness that negatively affects how you feel, the way you think, and how you act. So it means that there are several symptoms that could describe and define depression. Among them, feeling sad and loss of interest or pleasure in activities once enjoyed are the core symptoms, followed by some others, as for instance, changes in appetite or difficulties in sleeping, physical activity and concentrating, feeling worthless or guilty, loss of energy, and thoughts of death or suicide. Maybe you can recognize some of them, but of course, don't be scared because just having one of these symptoms does not mean uh, having depression, but um, uh, these symptoms should persist for at least two weeks. And making the uh, diagnosis of depression is not easy, but rather complex evaluation based on uh, medical history, um, um, course of the disease and laboratory tests. And also there are some uh, uh, tools available that could help a physician in order to make diagnosis. Among them, the mean international neuropsychiatric interview that uh, has been used in this study at the starting point to make diagnosis of depression. And then patient health questionnaire nine, that has been uh, used as a screening tool in order to uh, assess a variety of uh, depressive symptoms and has been used during the follow-up, so over the time. Uh, moreover, it should be considered that depression is a very common disease. Actually, according to the World Health Organization, one in five people will experience depression at least once in their life, and approximately 300 million people are affected by depression at a global level. Uh, projection estimates that the depression will become the leading cause of burden in 2013. Moreover, depression is a multifactorial disorder, so it means that uh, there are several factors that could increase the risk of depression. Among them, social network, physical activity, cardiorespiratory fitness, and diet. So the overall aims of my thesis was to assess the association between multiple social network characteristics and several lifestyle factors in association with depressive symptoms. More in detail, in chapter two, I worked on the association between social network characteristics and depressive symptoms. Later in chapter three, I worked on the association between physical activity and depressive symptoms. In chapter four, I um, uh, focus on the association between cardiorespiratory fitness and depressive symptoms. And lastly, in chapters five and six, I worked on the association between diet and depressive symptoms. <clears throat> For almost all the results presented in the, in the current thesis, data come from the master study, an uh, ongoing observational study that focus on the causes and complications of type 2 diabetes. And participants were those living in the south part of the Netherlands, so in the Limburg area, aged between 40 and uh, 75 years old. Let's now focus on social network characteristics. They are the frame uh, within which people living interact, compete, and cooperate uh, uh, among each other and they are listed as one of the main determinants of health by the World Health Organization. However, studying social network characteristics is not easy, 
but um, a um, comprehensive approach should be used in order to assess both the functional and the structural characteristics of social network. And we refer to the functional characteristics when we refer to the support perceived by the person. So as for instance, information, emotional or practical support. And when uh, we refer, refer to the structural, when we refer to the size and frequency of contact. Uh, in the mastery study, we use a name generator questionnaire uh, that allowed us to assess both functional and structural by asking people to name at maximum five person for seven different types of contacts. And in particular, for functional characteristics, we collected data on informational support, emotional support for important decision and discomfort, for, and practical support for job and sickness. And regarding the structural characteristics, we collected data on a network size, type of relationship, so if family members or friends, living alone, uh, frequency and proximity of the contacts, and uh, social participation. And uh, I found that less emotional support and lower percentage of family within the, the network were associated with a lower risk of depressive symptoms. Regarding physical activity, we know that uh, a higher level of physical activity is associated with a lower risk of depression. However, evidence collected so far comes from self-reported data, and in most of the cases, they did not take into account timing and intensity of physical activity. But the recent availability of a triaxial accelerometer allowed to objectively measure physical activity. And for this reason, in the mastery study, we used the active poll uh, that allowed us to collect information on vertical, anteroposterior, and mediolateral axis, and also information on posture. So as for instance, lying, sitting, standing, standing and stepping. And the triaxial accelerometer was attached directly to the skin of the right eye of the participant, and we asked them to wear for 24 hours for eight consecutive days. Um, what I found is that participants with depressive symptoms were more sedentary compared to those without these symptoms, and in particular, they spent uh, on average, approximately 20 minutes or more in sitting activities compared to those without these symptoms. Moreover, participants with depressive symptoms were also less physically active, uh, both considering light physical activity and moderate to vigorous physical activity. In particular, considering light physical activity, participants with depressive symptoms were approximately 30 minutes more um, less physically active and considering moderate to vigorous physical activity, they were five minutes less physically active compared to those without these this symptoms. Regarding the daily patterns of physical activity, I found that uh, uh, participants with depressive symptoms were more sedentary, in particular during the afternoon and early in the evening, and they were less physically active almost all during the day. Uh, regarding cardiorespiratory fitness, we know that physical activity is one of the main determinants of cardiorespiratory fitness, that it is defined as the capacity of the lung and um, heart and vascular system to supply oxygen and nutrients to the muscle during the physical activity. However, there are also some other factors that could influence the cardiorespiratory fitness, among them the body weight, smoking habits, genetics, and comorbidities. And in the mastery study, we assess the cardiorespiratory fitness by means of submaximal cycle ergometer test. And what I found is that an higher level of cardiorespiratory fitness is associated with a lower risk of depression. And focusing now on diet, evidence collected so far assess the association between a single food and risk of depression but rather people eat meal. And so it is really important to understand the association between a diet as a whole and risk of depression. And in particular, the association between healthy diet and risk of depression. Actually, despite the general consensus on the definition of uh, healthy diet, there are several score operationalization system and also uh, different type of so-called healthy diet. Among them, the most frequently studied are the Mediterranean diet and the dietary approach to stop hypertension. Uh, they are based on a daily consumption of uh, cereal, especially wool grain, 
uh, legumes, beans, uh, seeds, uh, fruit and vegetables, a moderate consumption of fish, poultry, eggs, and dairy, in particular light fat dairy, and a limited consumption of red and processed meat, processed foods, sweet and sweet beverage. And um, the characteristic of the Mediterranean diet is the um, high consumption of olive oil as the main source of unsaturated fat. And for the dietary approach to stop hypertension is the um, limited intake of salt. Actually, it was defined uh, firstly as um, um, in order to identify a diet able to reduce the risk of hypertension. But we have also the Dutch healthy diet that uh, is based more or less on the same uh, food consumption, but uh, uh, it is based on a 50 food based Dutch uh, um, dietary guidelines updated in 2015. And uh, they are developed in order to capture the food habits of the Dutch population. So based on that, we assess the association between uh, these three uh, a priori defined dietary pattern and risk of depression within the master study. And what I found is that an higher adherence to the Dutch healthy diet was associated with a lower risk of depression, but we did not find an association between Mediterranean diet or Dutch diet. And uh, probably because of the um, cultural differences in, uh, in food habits, uh, and so be probably because a low adherence to Mediterranean diet in our studied population. To conclude, uh, we use a um, comprehensive approach uh, in order to assess the association between uh, um, multiple social network characteristics and several lifestyle factors with depressive symptoms. And what I found is that a more supportive network was associated with a lower risk of depressive symptoms, as well higher level of cardiorespiratory fitness was associated with a lower risk of depressive symptoms. Moreover, spending less time in sedentary activities and more time in uh, physical activity uh, were also associated with um, a lower risk of depressive symptoms. So here the main message is to be less sedentary as much as we can and more physical active as much as we can in respect of the timing of the day. And lastly, also, uh, even more healthy diet is associated with a lower risk of depressive symptoms. Um, these results have some implications uh, because all these lifestyle factors and social network characteristics are potential targets to prevent depressive symptoms. And they are useful in public health policies because they can prevent strategies, um, inform preventive strategy to promote healthy lifestyle and social factors. For the future, I would suggest to, um, uh, in particular, assess if there is any dose response or interaction effect. Because actually, in this thesis, I only worked on a single food, on a single lifestyle, and but they can. Uh, uh, interact among them, and so probably uh, there is still room to further study in this direction. And also uh, to um, uh, perform international study in order to assess the cause of, uh, of the depression. Thank you for your attention. I will give the floor back to the prorector. Thank you very much um, for your presentation. And we will now start with the uh, opposition. And the opposition will be opened by uh, Professor Kremers, <coughs> also the chair of the assessment committee. He's professor of health promotion at Maastricht University. Professor Kremers. Thank you very much. Dear candidates, uh, let me first um, start by congratulating you with, um, with the wonderful thesis that you uh, wrote uh, in the past couple of years. And actually, I was not only struck by the contents of the thesis, but also by the CV that you put in the end of the thesis, um, showing a remarkable publication list that you have uh, produced over your academic career. Um, this is um, uh, this struck me, um, but um, seeing your presentation and hearing you talk, I now understand where the speed comes from. Um, so I'm, I'm assuming that you do not only speak very quickly, but you also write very quickly. And that must explain the, the extensive uh, CV that you already have um, 
So my, my compliments for, for that. Um, but of course, I also have a couple of questions. And um, my first question relate, relates to the um, uh, chapter three, um, where you studied the relationship between uh, physical activity and um, um, depression. And you did some interaction analyses there. And one of the interaction terms that you used was by um, studying the interaction with sex or gender um, in the relationship. Um, and indeed, I see there is a, a relationship um, in table 3.1. There appears to be a relationship between gender and, um, and the prevalence of uh, depression. But there is also apparently a, there appears to be a, an association between age and depression and also between educational level and depression. But um, still, you did not decide to test interaction with those two demographic factors age and education. Can you explain me why you did not do that? I esteemed opponent. Thank you very much for your kind words. And uh, regarding your question, we assess that we, we, we know already that depression could differ among the sex, so among the gender. And so that's why the reason why um, we assess the interaction analysis by gender but uh, we did not test actually uh, interaction um, for the age, for instance, or the social demographic, other social demographic factors. So, um, but we, in any case, adjust for uh, this variable. So uh, it is, we know that um, people are, um, the, the age of the population is growing up. And so also age is becoming one of the challenges from a public health perspective as the depression is, because uh, we know that the burden of depression is really high and it will be become probably even higher, as I said in my presentation, also because of age. Actually, uh, depression is characterized by two types of peak. Uh, of uh, instance, the first one is in uh, late uh, uh, teen, uh, mid of 20s, and the other one is in late life, as for instance, around six years old. So let me, let me interrupt you. Let me interrupt you here because I'm mostly interested not not so, so much in age, but much more in education. And um, um, I think there is uh, evidence that uh, depression is more prevalent among. Um, vulnerable groups, lower educated groups, um, but still you have not um, tested that. And then, of course, there can be many reasons uh, for that. But what would, would be your hypothesis, hypothesis regarding relationship between lifestyle and depression based on, um, let's say, education or maybe even um, socioeconomic background uh, where education might be a very good indicator of that? Um, and, uh, choosing which type of variable could really represent the, the economic status is not really an easy choice, let's say, because there are many of potential variables that could be used for this aim. But um, I think that the educational one could be one of, uh, of the, the main uh, variables that we can uh, uh, choose because um, education has been proved to uh, impact on many, many other factors, uh, as not only on the economic status, but also uh, related to the type of job uh, that, of course, also impact on, uh, on economic status. And also education is one of the main factors of health uh, in, uh, in general, because it has been proved that uh, education really affects uh, the capacity also of the people not only to understand uh, information related to health, but also uh -huh. to decide as, for instance, to address to screening uh, uh, program that also, of course, impact on the final status of health. Yeah, uh, so that, that, that would be very good reasons, wouldn't it, to, to at least test the potential interaction between education level and um, uh, physical activity in determining depression outcomes. Maybe you did do the tests and did not report them. Could be the case. So in, if no, that would we, be the case, then I would no, be happy to hear that. Yes, indeed. Uh, we did not test the interaction between education and, and uh, 
the other variables, but we test. So what would you what would you hypothesize on the outcome of that analysis? Um, I think that it would be maybe there in some interactions because, uh, um, as I said, uh, 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 educational level is really related to to health outcome. So probably there would be something there, uh, but we did not test. So I, I do not have the correct reply, let's say, um, but we only test for diabetes and uh, sex because sex, as I said at the beginning, because we know that depression differ among the two sex and diabetes because uh, the um, oversampling design of the, the Maastricht study. So uh, in order to to increase the robustness of our result, but we did not find any type of interaction in any of the type of the uh, analysis that we performed. Uh, so in all the chapters, I checked for the interaction, but I did not find. So. Um... Okay, well, maybe that would be then very nice to do later on, not later today, but you know, somewhere in the future, because actually I saw in one of your propositions. <laughs> Uh, related to COVID, that you are interested, particularly interested in um, vulnerable groups. So this might be an indication, at least, to see um, what's going on uh, there. But um, let's uh, leave it um, with this for this uh, moment, and I give the word back to uh, the pro rector. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kremers. Uh, the opposition will now be continued by Professor Pennings. She's professor of psychiatric epidemiology at the Amsterdam University Medical Center in Amsterdam. Welcome, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, dear candidates. I also would like to compliment you first with uh, a thesis that is very broad uh, in, in content. And I think this uh, uh, fits you very well because I was also amazed by seeing the list of your publications at the end. And I think you could have chosen to graduate on a thesis focusing on COVID vaccination as easily as uh, on selecting the theme of the epidemiology of depression. So, um, but since you did, did chose that, obviously we are gonna have a discussion on um, the impact of lifestyle and social networks uh, on, on depression. So I, I first wanna start out with having some discussion uh, on chapter five, which is the umbrella review on nutrition and, and depression. And um, you conclude in the abstract of this um, chapter the following. You're saying, considering the generally high heterogeneity and low quality of the available evidence, further studies adopting more coherent and uniform methodologies are needed. So um, I just first want to start by asking uh, some questions on uh, this general conclusion. And, ask you the question, what exactly is the problem with the low quality of the available evidence, in your opinion? Yeah, I list the opponent. Thank you uh, for your kind words and for this question. Um, what I uh, saw um, looking for and working on this umbrella review is that in general, the uh, quality of the meta-analysis published every day is not really, really high. Ours also has been published in a previous publication that um, actually um, uh, assessed the usefulness of meta-analysis published. And in, so in most of the cases, they define this meta-analysis as flawed or not useful in terms of clinical aspects. And uh, uh, what I found in my umbrella review is that in most of the cases, the, um, in particular for this topic, that it is related to diet and depression, uh, I found that uh, uh, defining diet is not really is not really easy and also the um, uh, so the the methodology used uh, to assess diet and diet adherence was not uniform among the studies uh, included in the umbrella review and but yeah, no. maybe 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 talk a little bit more about that because I think this refers to the fact that you um, indicate high heterogeneity of the methods used. 
Uh, but isn't that actually a big advantage? Because I think actually, in my opinion, one of the, uh, the strengths of a meta-analytic -analy approach is that you look at consistency of results, no matter what type of method have been used exactly. And um, if I look at the results of this umbrella review and I look at the force plot that you present with the available uh, estimates from the individual meta-analysis, I actually do see an overwhelming indication of an association between unhealthy diet and depression. Uh, so my question really is, is it so bad that there is heterogeneity in the methods used? Um, well, um i the the point of the heterogeneity is that uh, uh, you cannot really uh, trust the end of the the results because you don't know uh, if the let's say potentially contrasting result that you have found among the meta analysis are due to uh, the through uh, differences or I mean, in the estimation or because of the methods used. So the, the really main important aspect of an umbrella review is not to um, combine and to estimate a, a new effect size as normally is done in a meta-analysis, but is- I know, I know. But if you just look at your figure 5.2 on, on page 108, I think lots of the meta-analysis that you summarize there were already uh, significant in the first place. Uh, and, and to me, you know, this really shows overwhelming evidence for an association, especially with the healthy diet and the Mediterranean diet and, and depression. Yes, I, um, I mean, for the Mediterranean diet, for the other inflammatory index, we found the highest level of evidence. So uh, this is the, the, that it is the main result of, of our umbrella review. And uh, of course, the uh, heterogeneity uh, highly impact on the uh, uncertainty around the estimated effects and the confidence in interval uh, of the, of the meta-analysis assessed. So um, uh, the, I think that the most important aspect for an umbrella review is, is to highlight which one of the meta-analysis available are the uh, meta-analysis performed with the highest level of uh, uh, um, quality. So in this case, it's really important because um, you can then refer not only just to the last published meta-analysis, but to the best uh, meta-analysis published. So in this case, of course, um, the, the importance is, is related to uh, the certainty and so not to be biased in somehow the result of the meta-analysis. And so referring to the last published does not mean referring of, of, uh, for, for sure to the, to the best one. And of course, um, a low quality of meta-analysis can of course concur in uh, uh, spreading misleading information. So that's why it's really important to conduct an umbrella review and to assess quality and strengths of evidence. So if you if you think about the evidence that we have currently, and, and you also conducted chapter six, which you know looks at this association in the Maastricht study, what do you still see? What do you think are currently the main research questions uh, in this, this, this field linking diet and depression that we need to tackle? For the future, yeah. Um, so I mean, do do we need more observational data, for instance? And if so, what? Or do you think it is uh, convincingly clear now what the link is, and we need to move on to intervention studies? Where where do you think we should go as a next step? No, I think that firstly, firstly, I think that we need to uh, add further observational study and then to move to interventional one because um, 
I think that the, one of the main message that we can uh, uh, catch up from chapter six, six uh, is that, um, uh, of course, uh, there is an association between a healthy diet and the risk of depression, but at the same time also using the type of um, uh, data reassessment is really important because as we know, uh, food is culturally based. And so uh, selecting the correct type of uh, score operationalization method and, and questionnaire also is really, really important because as I found in my uh, in my chapter six, only the Dutch healthy diet uh, um, was associated with uh, um, an higher adherence was associated with a lower risk, but not uh, it was not true for the Mediterranean and for the the dietary approach to stop hypertension, even if they are all considered healthy diet. So the main point is that uh, regarding the observational uh, study is that uh, selecting the, the appropriate uh, dietary score is firstly, the, the, is the first point that we have to take into account. And, uh, and then uh, um, starting from this evidence, I think that uh, making interventional studies are really, really important because in this case, we still need to, um, to assess causal causality. Actually, in, uh, in my work, I perform uh, both a cross-sectional longitudinal analysis, but even if longitudinal analysis can give us uh, the idea of the temporality, uh, it does not uh, uh, provide us uh, evidence on causality. And regarding in particular uh, interventional study, uh, performing interventional study on diet uh, and in general on lifestyle is not an easy task. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> and, and especially not uh, since you're looking at the onset of depression, so you're then thinking of prevention studies, probably. Uh, I mean, you may have seen the prevention intervention that we have done in the field of uh, diet, which included thousands um, European citizens and where we had nutritional program to reduce um, the uh, onset of depression, which was not successful. So. I think this is clearly an, an, an obstacle sometimes that some of the observational data that we get from cohorts, since there is so much other factors going on, like you described in your thesis, and so much potential other confounding also, um, that it's, it's not that easy to um, take direct evidence from observational studies and turn it into uh, causality tests with intervention approaches. So I think that's especially challenging for nutrition. I think it's important to do so, but we learn from uh, those experiences that it is not always a direct uh, translation that you can make. Yes, absolutely, it's true. And probably the potential solution could be pragmatic trials that uh, try to um, to be as much as possible similar to the reality, uh, both in terms of uh, characteristic of the participants and the type of setting and uh, and all the other aspects related to the the trials that. Um, usually uh, differ highly from the, the real world. And so um, probably uh, designing a pragmatic trial could be a solution. But of course, we have to take into account also the difficulties related to, uh, to making diagnosis of depression because of the characteristics of the depression by itself that uh, uh, it is firstly a chronic disease, so it it means that there are we need some uh, years before to uh, to to see the the diagnosis of depression, and also uh, it is really highly recurrent, and so there are many many aspects that uh, we, if we want to design a trial, we have to take into account. Thank you very much. I think this is a uh, uh, ti nice time to move on to the next question. So I would like to thank you for your answer and give the word back to the co-rector. Thank you. Thank you. I think you have to unmute. Hello? Okay, I'll do it this way then. Um, the next opponent is Dr. Benatti. 
Dr. Crambonati is psychiatrist at the University of Milan in Italy. Dr. Bonatti. Thank you, Prorector. Um, dear candidate, thank you for your presentation. I've read with interest your thesis. And my first question is a general question on the approach. Um, uh, as a psychiatrist, I wanted to know if you have in mind to extend the epidemiological approach to other psychiatric disorders, and in, if it's the case, which disorders? Um, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your kind words and for your question. Um, in this thesis, I use a comprehensive approach. That means that we looked uh, at different type of lifestyles for the same outcome, in this case, uh, depression and depressive symptoms. And uh, I think that, uh, of course, using this type of approach is really important and could be really helpful also for other psychiatric uh, disorders because they share the same multifactoriality. Uh, so it means that uh, in most of the cases, psychiatric disorders um, uh, are multifactorial diseases that uh, many type of other factors could uh, increase the risk of, of the disease. So um, having a multiple approach uh, is really, multidisciplinary approach is really important. And so understanding, of course, the rule of these lifestyle factors is really important because lifestyle is part of our life. And so uh, absolutely, I think that it is important, all, even if uh, also some genetics could, uh, uh, could have uh, um, rule in the etiology of these uh, disorders, in particular, if we think that uh, the schizophrenia, for instance, but uh, all the others are less, let's say, somehow associated with, uh, with genetics and highly influenced by lifestyle and social determinants. So um, I do not have any particular uh, program for the future uh, in, uh, in this case, but uh, if it is, I mean, if uh, th there will be some possibilities uh, to extend this, uh, this type of uh, studies also to other outcome uh, psychiatric uh, diseases, then uh, I will uh, proceed in this direction because, and actually I think that in somehow we should use this type of approach uh, for the future. Yes, I think it would be very important also <clears throat> due to medication, psychopharmacological medication that always have a big impact on dietary and on lifestyle of patients. Um, <clears throat> another question was about chapter three and your uh, umbrella review results. I've seen that um, you have found um, that people uh, have um, sedentary time, especially during afternoon, early evening and night time. Uh, I was wondering if you uh, found some explanation in the literature of why those people were mm, more sedentary during mm, the uh, time after the morning, otherwise. Uh Thank you for, for this question. And um, actually, we uh, hypothesized I at the beginning of the study that participants with the depressive symptoms could be less physical activity, in particularly during the morning because of the symptomatology. Um, so as I said in my presentation, one of the symptoms is uh, fatigue and difficulties in doing physical activity. So this was one of the main reasons why we assessed uh, the, the timing and intensity of physical activity in relation to depression and depressive symptoms. And um, uh, regarding the, the reason why uh, there is this type of pattern. I think that uh, the main one is uh, is the the, um, the symptoms associated with depression. That, um, but uh, um, we do not have any uh, other explanation for this, especially because at the end of uh, our analysis we found that uh, um, the participants with depressive symptoms were less physically active almost all during the time. So without any specific pattern of, uh, of uh, 
physical activity and sedentary time. We saw a certain type of uh, patterns for sedentary because we uh, um, uh, we obtained data particularly in, reg in regards to the afternoon and the evening. But uh, as you can uh, see from uh, the, the chapter, uh, the, the time lag within uh, during which participants were more sedentary uh, was very, really long. So we cannot say that in real terms that there is a pattern. And so also explanation for, for these, I think that uh, are still open, an open question for the future. Um, because as I said also, uh, we did not look at the causal causality, but we only assess the association. And uh, even if there are several uh, uh, potential exp explanation and uh, reason that uh, could explain the association between physical activity and depression, um, we do not have a um, strong idea behind uh, this type of pattern or uh, absence of this pattern. Okay, and then that's the, I mean, every psychiatrist, I think, think the same. Okay, I'm, I'm fine with the uh, answers of the candidate. Thank you, Dr. Benati. Then the opposition will be continued by Professor Savokul. Professor Savokul is Professor of Medical Microbiology at Maastricht University Medical Center. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Director. Uh, first of all, I also want to congratulate the candidate and also the promotion team for this uh, work, which is uh, described in this thesis. I think it's a very nice uh, picture on, on the field of uh, what we can do in the, uh, for the depression and also addresses really some new uh, aspects. But um, of course, uh, I'm not an expert in the field, uh, but nevertheless, I have learned a lot about this uh, multifactorial disease as depression is, uh, of course, as we mentioned already in there previously. Um, but um, nevertheless, I learned a lot about the importance of social networks and physical activity and diet, uh, et cetera. But nevertheless, I came across some, uh, some questions, of course, which I want to have a discussion with you on. Uh, first of all, I was wondering, in more general, uh, we sent you uh, studied a single lifestyle, uh, and several several topics. Uh, how do they interconnect uh, in your vision? And more or less, they do interconnect, of course. But how would that influence your results? Uh, would that uh, be um, improving your results when you do this combined analysis, or would it uh, really? Uh, be of negative influence to your results. What, what do you think about that? Hi, Listium opponent. Thank you for your appreciation and for this question. Um, I think that this type of lifestyle can absolutely interact among them. As for instance, if we think uh, at the social support, uh, we know that um, people who are more socially supported, they can have a better self-management. And so it means uh, in general, uh, having a better um, or healthier lifestyle, but also they can also have uh, um, uh, better self-care man management. So also if we think a um, subject with some diseases, chronic disease, for instance, as uh, depression is, uh, we know that the more socially supported uh, subject can also um, improve their capacity to take pills or follow the instruction for the therapies, for instance. But looking at the lifestyle, we know that uh, also um, having one of the lifestyle, healthy lifestyle is also associated and often associated with having another type of healthier lifestyle. As for instance, um, if we look at diet, uh, uh, having an healthy diet is even is uh, often associated with being physical active. And so, uh, as I said, social uh, interaction, uh, social uh, support is really important in uh, uh, improving these people, in general people, to have healthy uh, lifestyle. And um, so 
Um, as I conclude uh, in my presentation, I think that uh, this is one of the main uh, aspects that we should uh, look at the future in the future studies, because, uh, of course, in this thesis, I just focus on uh, the association and the rule of just a single uh, lifestyle factors and the risk of depression, but uh, they are uh, highly interconnected connected and so it's really important to understand if there is some some interaction effects uh, among these lifestyles and how uh, they then impact on on depression and uh, depressive symptoms so um, uh, absolutely we did not test now but uh, uh, I think that it is for the future is still an open question. Yes, I, 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 I fully agree, of course. And, and, and this brings me also to my next question, because regarding your answer, I fully agree that we have to look to the future. And then, of course, uh, you come in discussion is always a, a matter of course and consequence, of course, with these uh, different uh, factors. But uh, wouldn't it be better uh, for the future uh, to include more objective measures like the amount of neurotransmitters, for example, like serotonin and dop dopamine? or even as you also mentioned in chapter five, the diversity of the gut microbiome to underpin the effects of social networks, physical activity and diet. So to combine these data in one analysis, wouldn't that be better? And how would you see that how that could be done? Uh, can I ask you to repeat the question, sorry? Yeah, you have a lot of data. You, 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 you said also we, they have an interconnection. But wouldn't it be better than add to these data some more objective data uh, like neurotransmitters or the gut microbiome to combine all these data in a new perspective uh, and draw conclusions from that? And how do you think that would that be possible? Um, so if I understood correctly, um, you are asking me how to objectively measure social network characteristics? Or... Yeah, to combine, because there Com is a multifactorial disease and all these factors you can study individually, as you did now with a single lifestyle, or you can add some other objective factors and combine your data with all these data together in one analysis. Is that possible? And how? Um, so... Uh... Firstly, I think that uh, um, as, as uh, we said at, at the beginning, we have already a lot of data. So I think that um, uh, firstly, it's really important to make advantages of this data, um, also considering the amount of money spent in order to perform this study. And so it's really, in um, uh, if we think in a sustainable way, I think that the first point is to make advantages of all the data that we already have and then plan a future, a future study. And in this perspective, I think that... Um, uh, but but if, if you make use of the current data, yeah, would artificial intelligence, for example, add more to the data which we already have and came to come to a combined conclusion uh, Do you think of, that's a way to go or is it impossible? Of course, uh, using artificial intelligence uh, could help because in, uh, it can, uh, it can um, uh, analyze a uh, high number of uh, an high quantity of data in a short time. And uh, of course, it can uh, be very helpful uh, uh, also considering the availability of this data that we already have. And... Um, uh, also, I think that using or making advantages of some uh, uh, um, smartphone or applications could also help in adding the, the information and especially for the, the variables that we have some difficulties now, as I'm thinking as for instance, uh, in measurement, measurement of social network or diet, um, there are an increasing body of evidence regarding the use of app in order to estimate the amount and quantity of food, for instance, eaten during the day. Uh, or, of course, also the, um, regarding social network, I think that uh, smartphone and app could, could help in, uh, in better assessing the 
the type of interaction, the, the duration of, of course, or also assessing the uh, virtual uh, social network. Um, yeah, I think I think I think uh, there are a lot of possibilities. If I hear your answer uh, now, and I'm glad that you are thinking about that. And uh, on behalf of the time and the other opponents, I'll give the word back to the director. Uh, uh, thank you for your answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then the opposition will be continued by Dr. Unema. Dr. Unema is associate professor of health promotion at Maastricht University. Thank you, uh, Prorector. Um, I would also like to start with uh, congratulating you and also your supervisory team with your very nice dissertation. And you addressed a very important topic, trying to identify changeable factors that can potentially contribute to the prevention of depression. And I share your interest in identifying useful target points for prevention of depression. And I'm more specifically interested in how to translate these into evidence-based prevention interventions. And I have some questions or some food for discussion uh, about that for you. But before I ask these questions, I, want, uh, I would like to ask you to explain what your definition of prevention is to make sure that we are on the same foot in, uh, are on the same note in what we understand with prevention? Um, we have different type of prevention because we can refer to the type uh, to the primary prevention. So it means able to um, uh, to intervene on healthy people in order to prevent, so not to uh, develop uh, the disease. And then we have uh, pre secondary prevention. So it means that in, we have to uh, work with people that uh, have the disease, but they are not aware of it. So we are working on them in order to make um, earlier diagnosis of the, of the disease. And then we have the third uh, type of prevention. So it means that we have, we have to work with patients uh, in order to reduce the risk of complication. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. That's a very nice definition of um, three types of prevention. But, but in your thesis, you are talking about prevention. You also give recommendations about target points for prevention. But, but what do you mean? Do you refer to the primary prevention? Or do you prefer to the <coughs> prevention in the patients to not get a situation, uh, have the situation getting worse? Uh, I think that for uh, depression is really important to considering both because uh, uh, firstly, we know that depression is really a common disease with a really high, high burden of disease. And so firstly, it's really important to reduce the burden and so the instance of, of this disease. But from the other side, we also know that depression is highly recurrent. It is estimated, estimated that uh, approximately 80% of the, the patients will experience a recurrence of depression. So um, having also this into, in mind is really important to considering also the, to prevent firstly the risk of recurrences and then risk also of complication, other complications of related to depression. Um, so uh, I in in the thesis, I think that um, these two options, these two aspects, should be uh, considered uh, uh, when reading the the content. Yeah. So, okay. So then I will come back to that later in one of my further questions. Uh, thanks for your uh, your clarification. Um, yeah, I was interested in the recommendations that you provide uh, um, uh, for all these uh, other chapters that you have. And in um, almost all the chapters, you find that one of the exp uh, one element of the exposure factors that you investigated was indeed associated with depression risk. And then you implicate this factor as a potential target point for intervention. And you nicely demonstrated that in your um, in your introduction uh, presentation. Um, so my first question is, um, is, it, uh, is it possible based on the type of studies that you uh, did uh, to provide these kinds of recommendations to say, well, you have to, to uh, improve something about the social network, improve social support, 
in, we use sedentary behavior, improve physical activity, improve uh, cardiovascular um, uh, fitness, uh, improve healthy eating. So can you really make that kind of recommendations based on the type of studies that you conducted? Uh, well, uh, I conducted an observational, stu observational studies. So as I said uh, before, I do not have um, evidence for causality, but just temporality when we refer to the longitudinal design. So we know that the, these lifestyle factors and social determinants are associated with the um, risk of depression. So um, I think that uh, this type of evidence is really important to inform uh, future studies, uh, interventional one, but they have some limitations, let's say, if we want to directly translate them into actions uh, for the general population. So just uh, transforming them into uh, policies. They can inform these policies, but we cannot say for sure that, uh, um, for instance, having a more so, so, uh, support, uh, supportive social network will, of course, reduce the risk of, uh, of depression. Um, so uh, I think that they are different level of, uh, of evidence, mm -hmm. and uh, I, but at the same time, they are um, uh, good enough to, to, to be added to other to the, to the body of the evidence already available and make them uh, new studies, uh, interventional studies, in order to, as I said, to um, assess the causality and then, based on uh, on these potentially new results, then uh, transform it in uh, in intervene in um, actions. Okay, thank you, um, Pro Rector. Do I have a little bit more time to? Uh, no, I'm talk? sorry because we're running out of time, and I want to give some time to the last opponent. Okay. So then uh, thank you. I give the word. Uh, thank you for your answers, and I give the word back to the Pro Rector. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Unuma. Um, the last opponent of today will be uh, Professor Segers. Professor Segers is Professor of Complex Genetics and Epidemiology at uh, Maastricht University. Professor Segers. Thank you very much, uh, Prorector. Dear, dear candidate, also I congratulate you. I will do it a bit more short now, but I, I really like the thesis. Uh, I think it's a very important topic. And also congratulate you to the, the Maastricht study team. I think uh, yet again a good, uh, a good thesis and also to this, uh, this collaboration that we have now with Italy. And yet again, a very good PhD. So uh, congratulations to all of that. But of course, um, my first question is, um, what's new about this uh, topic? So if, if I look at, um, at at your chapters, and I was looking at your summary, I think, so, so what are your recommendations? One is you say, um, if you have more friends, then you're more happy. Or if you're more physically active, uh, then you're more happy. And if you eat, uh, uh, as, as a Dutch person, eat more healthy Dutch diet, and you're also more happy. So what, what, did, what did we learn? So, so I went to your summary. Uh, basically, you say chapter one says this, chapter two says that. There was no, no overall conclusion. So I went to your valorization chapter. And I also missed, I missed a little bit what, what is now, what is new? Maybe you can explain it to me. Uh, I list him opponent. Uh, thank you for your kind words and for this uh, for this question. Um, I think that the, the novelty of uh, my thesis is the, as I said before, the um, comprehensive approach that we used in order to that allowed us to understand better in let's say in somehow in real words what. Uh, the lifestyle factors uh, can impact on uh, on depression in particular, and um, uh, moreover, 
even if uh, in somehow uh, it is already known that some of these lifestyle factors are associated with uh, with depression or depressive symptoms um, we added uh, information and specification to, to this type of association as for instance regarding physical activity uh, we use an objectively measured physical activity and we also did not just uh, assess the association between physical activity, doing physical activity and the risk of depression, but also we looked at the timing and the intensity of physical activity that uh, it is not normally assessed in uh, literature. And also- Just, because... to, just to interrupt you, huh? um, um, because of the time, sorry about that. Um, there are many other risk factors for, for depression um, and Maastricht study is known for its extensive phenotyping. So, so can you mention a few other important risk factors that uh, that you didn't look for or didn't look at and that uh, for which master study has data available um for other lifestyle factors uh, that could be associated with depression there are uh, many honestly but uh, for instance also um the let me, let me name a few and, and then ask you why didn't you take them so uh, the stressful life events or all the, the biological uh, uh, measures like Professor Savako hinted. Uh, uh, so, so why didn't you take these into account? Medication use, high blood pressure is, is known to, uh, high blood pressure medication no, known to link to depression, all those type of factors. Uh, well, uh, I could not assess everything, of course. <laughs> uh, I had to make a, a decision, and uh, and so we, as a team, opted for for these uh, lifestyle factors and social determinants that, at the end, we uh, on on which we worked on. And um, regarding the examples that you mentioned, I think that as for instance, the, the stress related events are of course, one of the factors that we could take into account because we know uh, as uh, stress and stress related event, events are really uh, oh, yes. highly related to depression. Um. The degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return.
Vincenza Gianfredi, the degree committee here present online has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense in view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Schaper is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Thank you, Prorector. Vincenza Gianfresi, do you promise to work in, in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Please answer to this question. Yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you. Then, by the authority vested in us by law, and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present online, I hereby confer upon you, Vincenza Gianfredi, the degree of doctor, and grant you all the rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, you will soon receive the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and the supervisor, affixed with the official seal of the university as now shown by the beetle. Thank you. The, hereby I give the floor to Dr. Annemarie Koster, followed by Professor Anna Odon. Um, Dr. Costa will present the laudation. Dear Dr. Danfredi, dear Vincenza, I'm very pleased to be one of the first on behalf of the team to congratulate you with your PhD degree. And in this speech, I would like to look back a bit on how you got here. But first, I also like to take the opportunity to thank the judgment committee to assess the thesis and all the opponents here today at, for making this defense possible. I would then like to start with a few words in Italian. Uh, carissima Vincenza, congratulazione di cuore. Questo è per te un giorno molto speciale. Dopo tre anni e mezza di impegno, sei ufficialmente dottore di ricerca. Per me e per il nostro gruppo che è a Maastricht è stato un piacere lavorare, uh, lavorare con te e collaborare con la professoressa Odone e il professor Signorelli. A nome di tutti i colleghi dell'Università di Maastricht, congratulazione anche a Daniele, ai tuoi genitori e a tutti i tuoi cari che ti hanno sostenuto in questo percorso. Sono sicura eh, che in questo momento sono estremamente fieri di te. And now I go back to English. <laughs> How did it all start? Back in September in 2018, um, Anna contacted Nicolas um, for to discuss a potential collaboration. And soon after, Nicolas asked me to join these discussions, after which Anna introduced us to you as a potential talented candidate interested to pursue a PhD project, a PhD project with us at Maastricht University in collaboration with Vita Salute San Raffaella University in Milan. In January 2019, we had a first meeting with Anna, Professor Signorelli, and you, uh, who came to Maastricht to, to brainstorm about potential topics that were still at the time very broadly about uh, epidemiology of diabetes. But then soon after we switched gears a little bit, um, considering your interest and you wanted to focus on lifestyle, mental health, and this became the topic of your PhD project. And considering this topic, um, we also included Miranda and Simone to join the team. And so it happened. You started your PhD trajectory officially on April 1st, 2019. And you came immediately to Maastricht to work with us for the first few months from April to September, 2019. And this visit was really good to get to know each other better, um, to closely work together on the first paper of the project. 
a first paper. That's what we had in mind. And we thought it was reasonable to think that maybe in these first few months, you could at least do this part of the statistical analysis uh, for this project. But we were totally wrong. From day one of the project, you really took ownership of your own project, which was remar remarkable for a first year PhD uh, student. And we were not used to that. So instead of working on one paper, you had to plan for the second paper finished in June and a plan for the third paper finished in August. You were on a mission. And that mission, mission was to get as much work done and as efficiently as possible in these first few months. And it turned out that it was not only true for these first few months, no, that was for the whole PhD project. And this speed, or I have to say sometimes rush, is one of the words that comes to my mind thinking about your PhD trajectory. You were always super dedicated and goal oriented, which I really admire. But for you, things had to move far forward fast. And this was sometimes a struggle as we, as Maastricht team, were very picky on quality, always giving you lots of feedback, maybe even sometimes too much. We focused on the tiny details of a, of a, of a table or a piece of text. You have, however, remained very patient and respectful, although I'm sure that must have been sometimes difficult also for you. Um, but I, I, I'm sure you know that our intentions were good and our goal was to allow you to publish high quality papers. And as a result of your dedication and our good teamwork, your work indeed resulted in all chapters published. Then you came for a second visit in January 2020 until March 2020. You have stayed with uh, your pal named Evelyn at the time, so you even lived in Belgium for a couple of months during your PhD. But then unfortunately COVID came, which was in the beginning hitting Italy very hard. And I remember your concern of keep coming to the office in these last few weeks that you were here. And at that time it was not so common as it is now. Then your travel back was even coming into danger. And mid-March, the first airports in Italy closed and soon after your own flight um, was, was changed, but luckily you made it back home on March 26. And a, a, a few days after, most of Europe actually went to lockdown. So you made it back home to your loved ones just in time. And the fact that you came to work with us twice in person was, was really important, uh, really important for our successful collaboration. Also, when you came back to Italy, we kept our bi-weekly online meetings and we never found you unprepared. This is another hallmark of your commitment and professionalism. Um, next to your work in Italy and your PhD project, also two very important life events happened, private life events. You got married with Daniele back in uh, 2020 in the summer, and in 2021, Fabrizio was born. Di Vincenza, you can be very proud of yourself, having your, having your PhD finished well within four years, with five published papers in international journals. And in the meantime, you had not to forget other responsibilities as well as in Italy. And not to forget all the papers published uh, aside from this PhD project. We as a team, of course, had hoped to be here all together live in Maastricht, which unfortunately not, that did not happen. But we keep, you at, uh, we keep you at the promise to come visit us next year. And we have another celebration all together. Vincenza, I want to end uh, thanking you for, for our good collaboration in the past year. And I wish you all the best for your future career. And then I give the word uh, to Anna. Cara Vincenza, dear Vincenza, I'm afraid I can't speak in Dutch, but uh, I would like to add a little bit to the story that uh, Anna Marie mentioned, telling what happened before the first meeting that we had together with uh, Carlo Signorelli in Maastricht. Vincenza, as only few of us know, came uh, to us in Italy from a different university, uh, seeking for advice to become an academic career and pursuing a, a PhD. At that time, and I'm glad Maurice is here in the judgment committee, we had just signed the memorandum of understanding for the external PhD program with the School of Capri. 
And uh, the idea was to talk to Vincenza to see whether she would be interested in being the first candidate to explore this Dutch-Italian research path. And I'm glad we, we did so. I am glad we, Vincenza approached us and I'm glad that we came together in Maastricht uh, at the hospital to meet Nicholas at the time discussing very broad research ideas around uh, epidemiology of diabetes on the Maastricht study. What happened next is what Anna-Marie recalled in her speech, and I'm glad we were there. Please remember that what I'm recalling now is also on behalf of uh, Carlo Signorelli, who is here with us, who is my mentor and your mentor, Vincenza, as well. And I'm glad that we could experience this together. And I'm talking about the struggles and the doubts around each research papers that you work on for your PhD, but also that we were here in Italy with you, daily supervising you at the beginning of the path, making you understand what is working in team, what is being supervised, but also supervising young researchers and young residents in public health. We were all together at the beginning, Professor Signorelli, myself and you, and now we are all in three different places. So not only life changes events happened to your life, but also to our lives. And I'm glad we could stay together and understanding a little bit of each other during this professional, but also human path. I would like to thank Nicholas and the whole Maastricht team, Anna-Marie, Miranda and Simone for this journey together. It was successful with Vincenza, but uh, I'm sure it will be, and this is the hopes that we, the Italian team have, will be successful also for other PhD candidates within this collaboration. I would like to thank the Judgment Committee and the University of Maastricht and wishing on behalf of Professor Signorelli as well, Vincenza, all the best for your life in the academic Italian era and the international public health community. Thank you very much. Dear Dr. Gianfredi, also on behalf of Maastricht University, I congratulate you with the degree you have acquired. I also like to congratulate your family, your friends, your loved ones, and uh, your supervising team, of course, with this uh, degree. I'd like to thank the members of the uh, committee present today online, especially those from outside uh, Maastricht, uh, Professor Pennings and Dr. Benati. Thank you very much for uh, being part of this ceremony. It's very much appreciated by the university that you have been able to uh, reserve time to be present at this uh, ceremony. I also like to uh, thank uh, the other members of the committee for being present. Uh, Dr. Gianfredi, um, we admire all the work you have done and we wish you a lot of success with your further career. And with this, I close this ceremony. <laughs>